In this supplementary excursion to his lecture on collaboration, which is also of course available as part of this unit, Urs Hirschberg talks about a couple of groundbreaking historical projects, an award-winning collaboration in 1998 with Phase X at ETH Zurich, and then, starting in the year 2000 at Harvard, a project called Event Spaces, which anticipated many of the features of social networks that were, at that time, yet to come. So, the work I'm going to be describing to you actually was also published in a book. It's now out of print, but um, there it is. There were a number of projects in there, and some of them I was involved in. So, I'm not passing this off as my own work as much as it was a collaborative thing and it was part of a team. And as a team, we had the honor of winning um, a prestigious Swiss award. So we were this website where many of these uh, sites run on, was shown on Swiss TV. We got the, what is called the, the Golden Bunny 1998 as uh, in recognition of these websites being sort of um, revolutionary at the time. So I want to tell you what was revolutionary. Here you actually see um, two from the jury explaining what's going on and we see about a bit of a confusing thing in the background. One of the jurors actually says, oh, you don't really need to understand what's going on, but it's shown in an interesting way. So I'll try to explain it to you. So that's one of these websites. And what you see is down here is the list of all the authors that take part in it. And you see that they're structured in phases. It's called phase X for that reason. So one phase is worked on after another. And you can see here we're now on phase one. And you see all the works in phase one that they're listed down there. And you can bring up any one of these works in the big screen and you see the author that did it. And one of the rules we had was that no one can continue to work on their own project, but they have to switch, choose somebody else's project to work on uh, with. So you see, you, you always, in the interface, you see where the, the work comes from and where it's, um, who then, uh, then what does something with it. So here you see a switch from, from this author to this author, and it goes from left to right and so on. Uh, it goes through many stages. Here we're in phase five. What we feel what that was a uh, um, you know, powerful way to teach the things that they were supposed to learn about computer-aided design, but it was also a powerful, uh, sort of a, like a, a different cultural model. So what we, to explain what people were doing, we always explained it with these graphics. So we said in the Gutenberg galaxies, it's always clear who the author of something is. You see a book that is published at a certain time and you know that these books influence other authors that uh, write books later, but you can never be sure about these influences. And the same in architecture. You know that people, for example, Le Corbusier and um, Walter Gropius both worked in the office of Peter Behrens, but you don't really know what they learned from him and how that informed their subsequent work. So that's because there's no explicit record of that. Now in phase X, things are sort of switched around. You still have the authors, but now they have to always exchange the model with somebody else and they have to pick somebody else's and that creates this sort of progress of going from phase to phase where you can not only trace the authorship, but you can also trace how a work goes from one author to the next. You can see here, when you now follow through these eight phases, you, you not only have one step of some uh, modeling procedures and some topic after another, but you also have a team of authors that each provided one step of the development. And you can see it there in the interface, how that works. And you could then say there's actually such a thing as a collective development of things. And you can also then look at, as we did then, at the whole process as, a, so as an, a, an aggregation of many different works, where the color of these works in one phase if they're taken up by a different author in, an, in the next phase and they keep the color of that first object, B, 
because they're sort of like offspring of that first phase, you can see that one color really takes over, or in this case two color, start to dominate very quickly. So these, it's a rather surprising uh, thing that you then can observe in these visualizations that we made at the time. So we felt that the, the, the new thing about this is it was common that people would share or exchange models, but not that how they would be derived from one another would be made so explicit in that interface. And that you could actually observe and trace collective authorship in the way that it was possible to do in phase X. So in fact, each and every author that was part of these projects was part of many collaborative teams that authored many collaborative objects, always sort of doing one step of this. And also when you, again, if we analyze these outworld views, as we call them, you see we also track the time that it takes to work on them. And some actually became these long, flat things. They worked on, uh, had worked on for a long time, but uh, the, the number of ops offspring is actually registered in the uh, Z direction. So the higher they are, the, the more offspring they had in subsequent uh, phases. So you see that there's some long thing that were worked on for a long time, but they weren't successful, weren't picked up by anybody. And on the other hand, you had these pencil towers works that were done very quickly and were done wildly successful later. So that's the type of thing you can read in these things. So this we not only did as uh, at ETH, but we also teamed up with other schools around the world here in this uh, project we called Multiplying Time where we had three universities eight hours apart. So the 24 hours were basically nonstop working on that same database where, you know, there's that's video conferencing at the time. We are all familiar with that now. And now we had the same team, not just these formal experiments, but uh, actual architectural projects worked on by teams around the world, from Hong Kong, from Seattle, from Zurich, and so on. And it worked, you know, not surprisingly, in just the same way as it had done uh, at, in, in our class in Zurich. We also experimented with other types of database-driven classes. In this case, uh, people modeled their own homes and then told stories about it. And that became like a collective storytelling space we called fake space. And you could then travel through that uh, space from sort of from image to image and always looking at different apartments, so to speak. So, and then I actually had an interesting possibility to go from uh, Zurich to Harvard at the time. So you can see here that's Harvard Yard, that's Gund Hall, that's where the architecture faculty in at uh, Harvard is located. And I came there to teach the first year students how to use the computer and of course having done these collaborative courses at in Zurich I thought oh I'll do more of that in at Harvard and and initially they said well we don't really need that here because we've built our building in such a way that people can always learn from another they always see what everybody else does and they they, they work in so you see the building is you, this it's what they call the trays it's like a big um, uh, space where all the students of the school share that big space and they all get to know each other they do this networking and you can see that everything they work on is very visible there but I was then able to convince them that the second way of exchanging information through the computer was also becoming more important there anyway Long story short, we did this class event spaces, which was a bit also took elements of phase X and fake space in, in that we taught the students to model their own homes. And here you see how this, the interface looks similar. Again, you have all the students. And here, by the way, sort of, this is more an interesting aside. All these pictures of the students we got from a folder which at the time was still uh, pretty openly accessible on the Harvard server. And here you look in the, to the code that I did at the time and you see that that folder was called Facebook. 
So it's the, the name Facebook, which, by the way, is a company that was then founded two years later at the same place by a person who I don't know whether they were familiar with what we had done two years prior there. So anyway, they didn't even invent the name, you have to say. So, um, and in many ways, what we did with the students there was sort of like a social network before the term was widely coined. So we had this, they all had to model their own homes. And then we did a Photoshop thing. Again, they could use somebody else's apartment to then remodel. And you see how this remodeling happened. Um, and here is another example of that. And you see how this case, and when somebody like that, a bit outrageous was done, then there was also a discussion about it that ensued. So there was, it shared many characteristics of a social network. There's even, as you can see, a like button that we have, uh, we had already invented before um, Facebook had that. Anyway, so of course, I don't know whether uh, Zuckerberg has ever uh, and had any uh, notion of this. I'm not here to suggest that we invented Facebook or anything, but just to say, this is what we did at the time. And we started with that in 2000 and did it uh, three years in a row in different ways. What we also did is, and that's again where this logic of collaboration comes in. It's not only learning, collaborating in the sense that you work over uh, your, uh, your colleagues thing, but in this case, we also developed a game together. So um, out of all these different apartments that they then freely played around with, they developed a uh, sort of a game that allowed you to hyperlink from one um, image to the next. And we had a whole interface for that. And that created then a whole maze of different places where you know, the students could build portals. In this case, for example, the portal is a fridge that allowed you, depending on the food you choose from the fridge, to get to a colleague's apartment. Anyway, all that said, um, this created a sort of a, a large hyperstructure where nobody was really in charge. And it evolved in a bottom-up fashion, just according to what the students, who they liked, who they knew. And uh, so in more than one ways, not just in the sense that what uh, students get to choose, um, get to use the files of somebody else, but also in the, in the fact that there's no boss here. This is very much um, related to the open, open source idea that we just looked at, that there is, in a way, um, this bazaar of different ideas that can happen, and it's enabled through the, um, the network and, of course, through the interface that gives you access and allows you to link these things up. So. Um, we called it a collective hyperspace, and we also talked about a creative co collaboration as the mode of how these people work together. So this here is a quote by Kevin Kelly. Um, a network is more a process than a thing. And these to visualize and to understand these processes, we created these visualizations that allowed you to see how things are linked up. But um, uh, it still isn't easy to imagine what happens in a complex network between so many players. So again, here's the book. And as I said, it's out of print. It assembles a number of projects, not just the one I showed you. And they're all from a different time. You know, they're from 25 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, older. But I think they're relevant when, uh, to show now, not just because they make me a bit nostalgic, but also because they show how we approach these new possibilities uh, that the connected world offered at the time. And so they're relevant when we think about collaboration today, where we maybe take all these things a bit too much for granted. And I think the this uh, curiosity and the um, the spirit that we had at the time um, is something that you know can still inspire today. So, so 
it's out of print if you want to get a book get this book but um namely i think uh the what i wanted to show you is the digital world indeed has a lot um has had a lot of impact on the way we collaborate and i think uh, if you got some inspiration about uh, collaboration and ways of collaborating um, i think there's many more that we can invent in the future and uh, if i was able to inspire you a bit with what i talked about from 25 years ago then i would be that would make me very happy so thanks for listening Bye-bye.